you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. Thanks for being here. As always, we appreciate you. Remember, the Chris Voss Show is a family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law, because she never liked you anyway. She wanted your wife to marry Bob, because Bob went on to that spectacular career of stockbroking and, and sp- stockbrokering and owning things, and, and uh, you're just still, I don't know, sitting around the house eating Cheetos on your beanbag t- chair naked. But anyway, guys, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn. Dot com for us, Chris Voss. YouTube.com for us, Chris Voss. All those crazy places on the internet. Today we have an amazing young man on the show with us today with his exciting new book that's going to be hot off the presses come, I believe it's July 23rd, 2024. That's like, what is that? Is that 7 I don't know. There's some math there somewhere in a code, I think. But the book is entitled Grand Theft AI by James Cox, and he'll be on to talk to us about that. AI hey, is so hot right now, they're putting it in books. James Cox <laughs> is an award-winning filmmaker who has written and directed several motion pictures, including Wonderland, starring Val Kilmer in the acclaimed short film Atomic Tabasco. That's I animo with Atomic Tabasco every morning. Wakes you right up with a coffee. A diehard 49ers fan, we'll forgive him for that. James lives with his fa- fiance in Los Angeles, where he is writing the sequel to his debut novel, Grand Theft AI. Welcome to the show, James, from a Raiders Thanks. lifelong fan. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. You know, Bay Area. Got it. Are you from? Oh. Are you from the Bay Area? Or I'm not from the Bay Area, Florida? but the one time I went to a Raiders game, the 49ers were playing. And oh. uh, it was like a prison yard, basically, right. trying to survive on a prison yard. Yeah, You were in the Coliseum. I was in the Coliseum. And yeah. I've never seen so many fights break out within 10 feet of me in my life. And it was it was like living in a prison yard. It seriously was. Like one guy came up to me who was a huge man, and I'm 6'2", and uh, <laughs> he looked like Bubba from the prison, and he said to me, that fries look pretty good. And I was like, yeah, you can take them. Just please, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. These are your fries. Yeah. But they were wonderful. You know, I think there was one person who got, th- we saw th- thrown head first down some of the, down, down kind of over our shoulders. He was thrown head first down the, you know, we we're up on the risers and you're just like, you know, you know, the mathematics of physics that it takes to be going head first down from that angle that you have to have quite the launch position. And I remember seeing it just going, well, that's interesting. But yeah, it's evidently they don't get along up there much. It's probably good that they moved into my town of Vegas. James, welcome to the show. Give us your dot coms where people can find you on the interweb, sir. JamesCoxBooks.com. Mm-hmm. And you'll find all my socials there. You can, it's a one stop shop for this book and the movies and all things me. There you go. Give us a 30,000 overview of your new book, Grand Theft AI. It is a heist that takes that goes down in the fall of 2051. It's an accelerated 2051, or at least it was when I started writing it. It is defined in large part by a domestic security event that went down eight years in the, in the backstory in 2043. It's kind of the 9-11 of the synthetic, ge- the synthetic generation in which certain model androids went haywire and tens of thousands of Americans were killed one afternoon. And as a result, you know, the, the technology has innovated at an exponential rate. And so there's an amount of luxury and opportunity that's enjoyed by those who can afford it and those who can't are suffering a pretty robust security apparatus. And mm-hmm. the, the neural implants that you jockey for, now they're mandatory, so everyone's on grid all the time. 
And in this dystopia come together like this surrogate family of ragtag thieves to pull off the heist of the century. And some of them are traditional mechanics like the getaway girl who saddles a monster of a motorcycle, a 2028 Hayabusa. Mm -hmm. And then others are specific to this world. You know, different kind of uh, hacker. One of them is called a Cracker Jack. One of them is called a Flyboy. And these are all very specified coders and hackers with applications that are required for the gig. And through the course of the caper, they get involved with much larger forces, not just the kingpin they're knocking over, but stuff that deep goes deep down into the root of the world itself and they wow. all end up having to make a choice there you go and those choices yeah. shape the movie it's billed as the matrix meets blade runner is that an appropriate analogy would you say i think so you know i think you know i keep i'll keep reaching for it i am quite proud of it you know it's always it's always been imagined as a cyberpunk landscape uh, Blade Runner is probably the best example example on film. Snow Crash, Neuromancer, all these types of things are big influences. I come from Silicon Valley, and I think that's accurate. And then I think also the Matrix side of stuff, because there is a, a commercial product called the Wet Wire, which is essentially a Swiss Army smartphone in your head that can go from AR to VR to full haptic sim. You can pop in and out. Hmm. And uh, very much like The Matrix. Wow, that sounds like awesome. The porn must be great on it. I'm you know, sure it's funny you should say that. <laughs> I'm reminded of the Tropic Thunder quote. You know, if you ever want to chart the te the progress of technology, yeah, just follow porn. There you go. And never go full retard. The it, it has some interesting things in the book too. There's a VR, an infinite VR prison time. There Which, is, yeah. anytime I have to deal with an Apple product, feels like infinite you know, <laughs> person time being an Android user. And I imagine there's a lot of AI in here. Would, how did you, did you map out, I don't know, kind of what our future looks like with AI, where we're headed? I did. You know, there, the movie, the book, I, keep, I will keep oscillating back and forth because at mm -hmm. some point we should get into a little bit of kind of how I got into the, the book writing role. But mm -hmm. I... It is a framed narrative. You know, chapters one, three, five, seven, nine are taking place in the heist time of late 2051. And then chapters two, four, six, eight, every time you introduce a new character or element to the world, there will be kind of a, it's almost like a biographical narrative short story chapter that mm. opens up the world build. But I think that if there's anything about this cyberpunk thing that for me is unique it's that so many times whether it's blade runner or whatever else you're just dropped into this world and maybe you get a little bit of a rewind and explanation but for the most part you're just chasing after you know for this one there are characters who are born before this podcast and so they are their histories involve stuff that we've already lived through and then mm -hmm. Uh, all the innovations that are to come kind of occur on a timeline and each one of them goes through it in from different points of view. There you go. So let's, uh, we'll circle back to that other question you wanted me to ask you about on how you got into writing. Let's talk about your history. People want to usually want to know about the author and tell us about how you grew up, what, what influenced you, what made you want to become a filmmaker and eventually an author and, and uh, work on these different storytelling devices. It, I mean, it has been a road, that's for sure. I, you know, I got a very young, fortunate, <laughs> I got a very young, fortunate break in the entertainment business. I grew up in Northern California making movies in my backyard with a camcorder like at 10 years old. Mm. I, went, I went to Berkeley for a couple of years. I uh, transferred out to NYU. And I was that kid that you hear about every once in a while that comes out of film school with this red hot short that it just exploded. Yep. It won at Sundance, it won a Student Academy Award, sold to HBO. And then when it hit Los Angeles, it really, the, the industry really responded to it. My first three meetings were crazy. It was Jerry Bruckheimer bought my first pitch on day one. Uh -huh. um, Ridley Scott and Tony Scott signed me to RSA. And 
Mike DeLuca and Donna Langley hired me at New Line to direct the Scott Rosenberg picture starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Jared, Le- Jared Leto. I was off to the races. It was, I, was, I couldn't even graduate from school because I was already <laughs> yeah, I was already on set directing a $14 million studio picture. Wow. There you go. Right. And that's- 23 years old, and, and there we go. And um, then I think we dropped one of the names of one of your movies in. Do you want to drop other ones? I think we dropped the Wonderland. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I the movie that I did at that point was called Highway. I had no idea what I was doing. I'll be honest. You know, it was coming from peanut butter sandwiches to thirty six trucks like literally overnight. Wow. I think the first day on set, like there was this hush across across shoot across the set because I had turned around the crew twice, which I didn't even know what that meant <laughs> at the time. So it took me a long time to figure out how to move the machine and Mike DeLuca ended up leaving New Line and that movie lost its theatrical release. So I struggled. I kind of had to figure it out like, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Which Mm -hmm. is when I think at that point I realized that if, you know, there was a big difference for me between director for hire and directing my own material. Uh, And that I also right around there and I read a script called Training Day. Okay. And that thing, cha- that changed my life. I'll be wow. honest. Like it was the best script I had ever read. I happened to read it on the date it published mm-hmm. and I got, it took me a day to get my agent on the phone and I lost my mind. I was like, dude, you got to get me on the room and the thing, the thing is insane. It's, I don't know why you tell me this teen scream stuff. It's the greatest, you know, and he's like, how, who, who sent you that script? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got it on a sample. And yeah, wait, what? <laughs> you know like he goofed and he's like no just that's just then he started back playing that's just it's like an a-list only script <laughs> oh wow it's like an a-list you only know which script. i wasn't obviously at the time and i just i realized like i if i was gonna if i was gonna direct what i wanted to direct i was gonna have to write it myself and so at that uh-huh. moment i think when you if you asked me like when did i i had written professionally I'd written personally, obviously, my whole life, but that was when it was all in, where I just knew I was a screenwriter. And so there was a true crime that came my way, which we discussed, called Wonderland. And it's this notorious true crime. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or seen of it, seen it, but it's starring Val Kilmer, and it is this grisly quadruple homicide that went down in the summer of 81. And I got my hands on the LAPD crime scene tape. and It was uh, a real thing, huh? the real thing you know like with it's you know i will never forget the blood on the walls you know Jeez. four bodies on the floor they didn't was, do it <laughs> i just want to make it clear me neither it's funny you should say it. anyway so bone shattering like wood but i ended up getting consumed by that thing you know i sat down with val kilmer to play the role of john holmes who is this infamous porn star at the center of the whole crime Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he sat there and he goes, James, I got to ask you this question might not be important to your process, but it's important to mine. Do you know, Don, do you know, Sharon, you know, and that's John's wife and girlfriend at the time played by Kate Bosworth and Lisa Kudrow. And I go, I go, Val, do I know? I hold up this necklace. I'm like, that's Sharon Holmes's wedding ring. I'm wearing it around my neck. I was so just all in. Lisa wow. Kudrow was like, ew, what are you wearing that for? Val was like, Woof! ripped it off my head faster than I could flinch, grabs this thing. If you've seen his Doc Holliday or his Jim Morrison, you know he's like a shaman, right? Yeah. He starts rubbing this thing like Aladdin's lamp, looking off into the ether. You know, he's like, oh, a lot of pain. <laughs> what a heartache. He looks at me, he's like, and a lot of blood. Wow. And, you know, that, I mean, the, the set was haunted. Really? We shot it. Yeah, we shot it. There were things that went bump in the night in my life that I could not explain. There were no atheists in my in this foxhole. Uh-huh. Like, ghost stories I can tell, but I, I won't, I'm already on a tangent. But we shot on the scene of the crime, and the movie wow. was just magic. It really caught, it caught the eye of legends. Like, mm. huge influences in my life, like... Michael Mann, Robert Town, Robert Zemeckis, Bob Evans, a writer who pro- would prove instrumental in my career, Shane Salerno, mm-hmm. William Friedkin, and Francis Coppola. Francis Coppola, you know, like, yeah. 
yeah, yeah, Val took us up to the took me in the movie up to the winery and yeah, like we watched it in his private screening room and the lights come up and wow. Francis comes at me with these fingers. He's James, you know, it's like straight out of Hearts of Darkness. He's like, you know, the opener of your movie, and I was like, oh my god, is this <laughs> happening? You know, it's like <laughs> this is all between before I turned thirty, dude. You know? That's like a rocket ship, man. That's like a it rocket ship. It was a ship. full. I mean, it was so funny. It was a absolute rocket ship. And uh, I mean, looking back, I realized, Chris, I I had no idea how fortunate I was. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was. It soon after that, I think, was when my demons got the better of me. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Cocaine and you hookers. Know? <laughs> Let's just say excess in every sense of the word. You know, you no, but I was, I was someone who always loved going out. You know, I mean, loved Martin partying. Scorsese has cocaine years from what I understand. I think he's admitted to that. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I loved, I mean, I went to the same school as he did. He was a legend in New York. Yeah. You know, I loved going out in New York City because that city never sleeps. And that's where yeah. I, you know, cut my teeth and going to school there. But, you know, I, I was someone who just could not draw the line between work hard and play hard. Yeah. It was all just one big juggernaut of energy. It's and I think, hard, yeah. I mean, honestly, like back then, deep down in my insecure heart, I really did believe you had to live life like a rock star to be an artist. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of all plays together, really. Like I've been a big Metallica, Metallica fan all my life. And when they got off drugs, a couple albums really sucked. And I'm like, can I just get back on drugs again? <laughs> You know, it's funny because I come from the music business. I came out of Atlantic Records and the, me and my best friend at NYU, he's now nominated for three Oscars for music. And wow. he's actually in the short Atomic Tabasco. He's got the cowboy head hat on. And I was shooting all of his film projects and I was writing lyrics on his album. And yeah, like a lot of my musical role models, you know, excess is the watchword. But it all caught up with me, you know, when my dad died. Mm. He... You know the signs of self-destruction were already there, but when he when he passed, I just buckled. Wow! And you so, know, did I that give you a, an awakening moment, a moment of okay, where are we at? Clarity? Yeah, I mean, I should have been in a therapist's office, yeah. You know, seeking professional help, but instead, I just said, "Screw it." Yeah, I you mean, know, like an they should deliver. Screw it. You know what you do? You hire the you hire the therapist to deliver the booze, hookers, and cocaine. That's what you do. And then that way you've got everybody there at the party. And you can, you know, and just every now and then you can lean over between the cuts and be like, hey, my dad didn't hug me enough as a child. What's up? Yeah, that's what I mean, I was making bad decisions already, so I started making really bad decisions. You know what I mean? Oh, no. But, yeah, I mean, I was, I, and I just, I, I'll be honest. Like, I was, I, you know, offended super talented people. Uh -oh. I embarrassed myself, embarrassed myself in very public arenas and showed up unprepared to really critical professional moments and blew mm. huge opportunity after huge opportunity out of ego, yeah. you know, yeah. aka fear, stuff that would have changed my life in a very real way. Uh, mm -hmm. Good movies, great relationships. I burned them all to the ground, man. I just didn't give a damn. So how'd you come out of it? My life got really small for a very long time until finally I woke up. Mm. At least you, you didn't know? go through the journey where you ended up in prison or the hospital. Unless you had you've left out not, that part of the story. <laughs> I did not end up in prison so or a good. hospital. That's good. Some people they have to hit that rock bottom before they... I was in the. I was Thanksgiving 2013. I was in the lobby of the of the Hyatt on Union Square in San Francisco. I don't know if you know it, but mm -hmm. all the hair shot up on the back of my neck, and everything changed. It was like some wind blew through me. Wow! And I was done running, and I was done numbing, and I got back to Los Angeles, and I got to work. Fig you know, facing up to who I'd become, mm -hmm. and finding the real me. There you go. And I think about that time, you probably were working on straight A's or billionaire boys. Yeah, I mean, you know, it took me a long time to figure out, like, who I was and, mm. you know, how, how to put myself back together again. And a lot of writing, you know, finding my real voice. And it's funny you mentioned Billionaire Boys Club because, you know, when that picture came together, that thing, I struggled. Hmm. Yeah, the logistics were arduous and the true crime was 
was a labyrinth, but it was the main character that was really hard to get right. This guy named Joe Hunt, who's still in prison. And I think it's because that project dated back to my darkest days. And I had this death wish fascination with condemned souls. Yeah. And a um, reflection of yourself. You know, everything you, everything I work on is always a reflection on myself. So maybe mm-hmm. what you're saying made a lot more sense. You know, when the <laughs> lens was a uh, was polished, yeah, so to speak, or at least you know. But anyways, you know, I it was was it really a cautionary tale that needed to be told, or or just this two twisted nightmare of greed and entitlement gone haywire, right? Yeah. And it was it was 2017. It was like a gut check for our business, and you really had to ask yourself. Did the world need a true story about white, privileged young men from Beverly Hills whose horrible financial crimes turn horribly violent? Are there any um, movies that aren't? <laughs> no. You know, I can tell you when that thing cratered, and it cratered for reals. Like, really? Yeah. I, you can bet I was in a therapist's office that week. Oh, wow. You had some great talent on there. Kevin Spacey. I mean, he's such a great actor. I, I really wish Incredible. We- He's done. He's been the court for all these accusations he's gotten and, and been acquitted. I'm really disappointed Hollywood doesn't bring him back. He, he's he's an incredible actor. I mean, I, so incredible is an understatement. Yeah, uh, and his body of work is astounding. I I, I kind of resent Hollywood actually over it. I mean, you know. I don't want to get you in trouble, I, so no, you can leave I mean, me under I, the bus. Like, on, like I was saying, I was literally three. It was like on a Monday and a Wednesday and a Thursday, three separate therapists, because it was it just was like that, and it was on the one yard line. I mean, we were literally screening for buyers, and it was tough going. What the heck happened? And I will, I got to give credit where credit was is due. It was my fiance who helped me put things in perspective. Uh, she is a, a brilliant and talented architect, a RISD graduate, a, a maker. But she, you know, she is a Academy Award-winning set designer, mm-hmm. and most importantly, she's a crew mem- crew member. Mm-hmm. So I was able to see Billionaire Boys Club and its demise through my crew's eyes. Mm-hmm. And you hear they say that our me- we're, our filmmaking is a collaborative medium. Mm-hmm. And it's so true. I can hear her words like ringing in my head, you know, like it takes a village to raise a child. And so many people like work so hard on that picture for so long. And over one weekend, it just evaporated, you know, wow. ju- juicers and teamsters and PAs and crews and me, you know, like years of my life, but a year from hundreds of crew members, you know, gone you know, we worked wow. through holidays and sacrificed precious time with our families. And for what? For a four-walled release on 10 screens to satisfy foreign? It was like, you want to wow. know what I wanted to say? <laughs> I want to say, screw that. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew where that went. So it looks like I, you took some time off after that. And is that what moved you into writing? I mean, that at that moment, I just started writing. Mm-hmm. You know, that process, that movie was a really, it was logistically arduous. And I had put the pen down for figuratively for like over a year. And Mm -hmm. so when I just got back on the horse, I started writing. It was stuff that I loved Mm -hmm. as a kid, Mm -hmm. like Star Wars, Alien, Aliens, Predator, Blade Runner, The Matrix, Snow Crash, Neuromancer. Mm -hmm. Like just characters at first, prose, like not screen f- screenplay format, like little mm-hmm. short story bios in a world set against the coming golden age of AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know what it was or where it was going. I just knew that it was what was true in my heart. World building sci-fi. Uh, this seamy dystopian technology crazed future with bots and brain computer interfaces and a government that's everywhere beginning and ending with your head but at its heart you know this time was this love story between two damaged battle scarred souls who come together to find redemption and survive 
There you go. You know, so, the the, wor- the world was dark and treacherous, but the characters were hopeful. You know, mm-hmm. aspirational, likable. Uh, mm-hmm. Ripley and Hicks, Indy and Marion, Neo and Trinity. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Baz like and Rhea. It sounds like you went back to your roots and you found, you know, where where your true love is of what you're, what you enjoy, you know, going through the cathartic moment and getting back to the basics is, as I like to call it in business, where, you know, you get back to what you love and you're, you're center again. You know, this, like I was saying, when I was finding my true voice, this was my true voice. Like Mm. this is my true voice. And, you know, the, the stories, they evolved into a screenplay that for a second was going to be my next movie. Mm-hmm. But then it just kept going and then oddly turned into a novella. Mm-hmm. And I just kept writing and the thing kept growing until eventually I sent the manuscript to my mentor, Shane Salerno, and he read the thing in a day. Really? That's good. <laughs> I mean, That's nobody good sign. reads anything in a day. If it's know? good, you do. Well, I yeah, mean, I mean, good, good, you know, like th- th- that's a loaded comment. Oh, I mean, it, it like really that. is because I mean, I you know, we've had authors in the show. If I get five seconds to read a book, sometimes the first fucking line just sucks me right in. I'm like, God damn it, you got to read that thing. You got to find out what happens. You know, I you know that I know where we're going with this one then because I you know he called me up and he just he said yo you know just a heist set in a Blade Runner Matrix world we can do something with this he was blown away by this new direction no one expected me to be harboring this secret passion for sci-fi and uh, you know he he also you know he imagined or he envisioned a world as bold and as far-reaching as I did you know he like Shane just got it. And he, you know, insisted that it was not in a condition to send out, you know, he did not think it was ready, but he wanted to develop it together further. And when the time was right, he would take it, we would take the publishers. And he was really honest with me. He was like, you know, I can't help you with directing movies right now, but I know how to get this book published. Ah. And we went to work on it for a number of months. And when, when it was ready, he took it to Blackstone Publishing. Mm-hmm. And they flip for it. And it's been a long road. I mean, I'm grateful that I've been able to share this thing with you. So thankful, <laughs> thank you. But it's, it, it was even longer getting the novel right. You know, it yeah. was working with a sensational team at Blackstone, Josh and Stephanie Stanton, Josie Woodbridge, my developmental ent- editor, Diana Gill, my copy editor, Michael Crane. Mm-hmm. You know, we just draft after draft. I, it, perfectionism, I, kept thanking him for thank mm-hmm. you i'm still thanking them for sounds you know, like you're at your oscar right? speech down for this because you're naming all the names yeah. <laughs> i am so proud of this <laughs> i do want to give credit if credit's due because yeah. i can go into it at some point but it there is a big there was a big learning curve going from what i had written yeah the pro stuff which was a voice that i had been developing on my own and then starting to work with the professionals at blackstone and so I am so very proud of this. It is the best thing I've ever done. And thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, thank you for coming. We're not done yet. It's, no, it's no, great. that was just the, <laughs> you know, the yard. That was part of the Oscar speech there. I get it. Yeah, you can, when you go, when you accept the Oscar for this movie, please do name us. I appreciate that. But uh, so it, it's probably, you know, writing a book is probably very different than writing a screenplay. Is that kind of what the learning process was for you? Yeah. Yes, the first leap was into this prose that I that in our line of work or in in the in the movie business, you are publishing as a writer writing that is not in screenplay format, and so it's whether it's in a pitch doc or a treatment, you know, you are coming out with prose. Been developing this this voice in through that that was starting to really heat up. And then it kind of exploded in this process that I was just telling you about. And then the the manuscript that Blackstone bought, to to put it mildly, the margins were wonky. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, if you, Eric Roth is a, is is one of the best screenwriters there is. And he always, he says, I think he said to the LA Times, you know, screenwriting is a very 
interesting idiom. You know, we use a lot of dots and dashes. Mm-hmm. And each one means something, you know, like when I use an ellipsis or a double dash in a screenplay, it's, it's, it's different than a period, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think Diana, my editor, I mean, it was just unwinding that and get, there's a thing called CMOS. I'm sure you know it, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I mean, so like I, even my quotations were like in a, and you know, you look, read, read, what is it? Oh God, Patricia Highsmith, her, her amazing one that is, uh, that Elizabeth Moss is in Handmaid's Tale. Oh, all yeah, the, yeah. all the quotations I think are in italicized. So there's definitely times where you just break the rules and throw them out the window, mm-hmm. but you better be Patricia Highsmith when you do it, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, there was definitely, there's a thing called, uh, at some point I'll tell there was a thing called head hopping, which was the real heart of the learning curve. Yeah, there you go. You, you know what I'm talking about? I don't. That sounds like something from your earlier days of of I was told. I was I was told you are a very humorous human being. <laughs> I've been told. I've been told that mostly by women who are just like you're funny. Bye. <laughs> you do make them laugh, though. That's about. That's about. That's about it. And then I make them cry. Uh, <laughs> you know, Jane and I were working on something a, a while ago, and it, which is in which Ocean's Eleven is, and that's a model oh, for this yeah. book, and that is one of the best lines. Does it? Does he make you laugh? He doesn't make me cry. <laughs> he doesn't make me cry. Actually, you should make him cry. I like him more. It's always the one so, that gets away. So yeah, head hopping is when you're bouncing from one character to another within a paragraph. Oh, okay. You know, and it's it's kind of a no no. It goes. It was once in vogue. Mm. So F- Frank Hubert and Dune and Francis, not Francis, and Ernest Hemingway does it. But it it's now like people prefer to be kind of keyholed into a specific perspective. And when you're directing a scene, mm. you've got to be in every actor's head at once. So if there's a transaction that's like a gun goes off, or someone punches someone, or someone sells something, whatever the heck, they come through the door everybody's head is interacting with that moment in a different way. And then they're interacting off each other and you're kind of playing this game of chess oh. as you're directing the scene. And so at, when I started writing this thing, that was what this was, was it was like, this is what I can't ever do on screen, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, I approached it like that. And so I was in everybody's head at once and, and cracking punchlines. One person was thinking one thing and someone was thinking the other and, man, unwinding that had to kill some babies. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got to leave some on the floor. But you're working on book two, right? So there's going to be a second sequel? I am. I go. am. Yeah. Oh, I have I to get my head hopping joke in. I didn't think that was a Hollywood term. I thought that was a North Hollywood term. <laughs> so, sorry, I had to get that one in there. <laughs> that is a, I don't, does everyone know what that means? I don't know what that means, but you it sounded like a good means. joke That's in my the head. valley. That's, that's, that's the, the Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights. Yeah, that's a uh, head hopping. Not sure what it means. <laughs> you can ask someone on the street in North Hollywood, and they'll tell you. So I had to get that joke in there. It seemed like too much to waste or too little. Either way, it's there. Sometimes we die on the show just to kill. We don't go for the kill. I would not we go right for the that die. dying. No, I would not consider that. I think my audience gets it at this point. Oh, I'm like, sure. I'm just, you know, and if they don't, they're like, what does that mean? Yeah, it's probably the wrong show for them. That or they're, I don't know, really religious. What's the chances of, do you think, is the second book going to come out soon? And what's the chance of this being turned into movies? I mean, you all the options, so you're, you've already optioned the book, technically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's up to the movie gods of it getting made. It's obviously, you know, comes from a filmmaker. It is a vid- visual world, it's a, you know, yeah. and it's, it's built. So, you know, I, I, the odds or the chances are, you know, Shane Salerno is, fan, is, is my manager and representing the book, you know, to the movie gods we pray and, you, you know, do the rain dance, but it is built for that, and... It is. It is a Michael Mann would be a good director for this. You mentioned him earlier, and I was I was reminded that Heat is my number one favorite film of all time. I mean, The Godfather. I don't know. There might have to be a fight, but which one's your favorite Michael Mann movie? I'm curious. Heat. Heat. Heat is one. Heat. Heat. Heat, heat is probably my favorite film of all times. Although The wow. Godfather has to be. If you were to say what is the greatest film of all time, it has to be The Godfather. But my favorite movie is Heat and then Godfather Second. But 
I'm really concerned because he's working on Heat the sequel, and I'm really not sure I want to have that. I, I, that, yeah, I that don't masterpiece know if it's a prequel. On. I don't know if it's a prequel or a sequel. Oh yeah, but I just don't want to see it ruined. It was like I don't know. I it's like it's Godfather Three, hands. basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or Matrix is. Three. Right. Matrix Three. What the fuck is going on already? I don't know. Wasn't that the byline? But no, he would be good for this movie. Rid Ridley Scott, of course. Michael Mann, be. Ridley, all of them. Yeah. You know, I, I, are we asking who would be my wish list? Yeah, who sure. Would come if you got on one, board? In, if you, you got know, one Charlie your... Booker would be quite incredible. He's the guy yeah. behind um, the Black Mirror movies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think Ridley Scott would be fantastic, or Guillermo would be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Guillermo del Toro. I yeah. mean, we're just going off like really heavy hitters you know so i don't know i like I'm, i i would love to i'm just kidding i'm just kidding you direct you know, i loved Blade, Blade runner 2049 I, but i i think it kind of it it loses it in the third act but the first half of the film yeah, is just I'd agree. sensational when they go to I the think, desert i think that's when we go off the rails i think when he's not the one. Oh, yeah yeah you know, that, you're, 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 he's back. like, oh, you thought you were the Messiah. We all did. And you're like, wait a minute. You know, like if Neo wasn't the one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a, a wish list. Now I feel unprepared in terms of who would be my wish list. But yeah, I, you know, the, <laughs> you're, you're putting me on the spot. Most, you're fine because most authors just lie to me and they go, no, I haven't thought of any movie stars or directors. I haven't thought of anyone in the film. <laughs> I think they're trying to have the best play on options. <laughs> they don't want to curse it. Oh gosh, no! I I would just a lot of it is for me is just the the opportunity for it to get to get translated to the screen and really to mm -hmm. hear any one of these guys that we're talking about, whether they're in a director capacity or a producer scenario, and they bring on somebody like especially where you know where they bring on somebody who wants to redefine a cy side of cyberpunk world. I'm just really excited to hear someone come in on board who gets it and be like, what, what, ha what has to go in there? And what, can what doesn't, you know, if it's a movie, is it a streaming thing? Hear people come back to me and, and tell me, Oh, this part, you got to get the kiss or you've got to get the moment where they do the deep dive or cause there, there is this, when your world to go through the world building chapters, it really gets exploratory. It goes into the main characters. You know, there's both the main character and the kingpin. Their their war record in in tour and in theater in in this global conflict that's called the Water Wars. Mm -hmm. And so it really gets out there. the The movie, you know, the book, the the heist itself is keyhole. It's kind of contained into the target they're hitting. But as you branch out into everybody's characters you're you're getting into these tendrils that go everywhere so i'd be really excited to hear you know someone come on board and be like james i love this and i love that but this part felt like fat and what if we did this so. sounds like it's got some elements that could be built out into multiple films which hollywood likes too as well you know That'd yeah it's be got it's i mean that was the idea you know when blackstone bought the first one they bought the sequel too um, mm -hmm. so it, the, with an eye and an eye on the series mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know it kind of i think there's a few of the things that you feel there are certain like when it comes to ai whether it's hal or skynet or in the matrix the war against the machines or with the replicants in blade runner right you have these meditations on what it means to be human Mm -hmm. and machines that rebel against their masters and i just found that i just was like that's not where this goes hmm. right that just felt there's a lot of, there's a lot of ai stuff everywhere right now but there's also a lot of researchers that are like the idea that a machine is going to rise up and you know conquer its master is preposterous. It's like there's if, if the safeguards are all in place. You know, the thing you really want to be afraid of is who owns these AIs. Oh. And the idea that they're going to rise up, you know, that's just an opiate to, to distract you from who's really got the boot on your neck. 
Mm. And so in terms of the meditation on what it means to be human, you're, you're dwelling, you're, that is all being told through the humans that are inside this world that are just trying to get by mm. and make a buck in a world in which the rich are just getting richer and richer. And the, like I said, like the, the, this event has created, it's called, like I said, it's called the glitch and it kind of opens the novel and it really creates the ability for certain sectors of, of, of society to gobble up and own these wildly powerful pieces of innovation. Wow. Like for, ex- for example, like where do you, where is chat GPT? Where is it? Like on the internet or on their offices? Yeah, like the, the actual thing, like the Whopper. The the brain, as it were? I don't know. Yeah, like I had to call a buddy of mine. It's in the cloud. Actually, yeah, no, I thought, I was like, is it just out there in the ether, in the cloud? He was like, just, it's in a data center. I think you pray to it and it appears right. or something. <laughs> it's in a temple. It's got I this large. you sacrifice there's all these, chicken. You know, vases of black goo. Yeah. Um, you do that scene in Angel Heart with the chicken and the voodoo stuff they do, you know. That's that's how how it works. I'm a big fan of Angel Heart. Isn't you such know, a you're bark, you're bar- you're 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 climbing up the tree for such sure. A, I could watch but that. Yeah, all so, day long. yeah, so that that is kind of the that I found that is to be kind of painting you into the corner of like what, how are you really going to get better than how winding down going days you <laughs> you know. Or any of the stuff in the Matrix of the Animatrix or Skynet. I just kind of was like, I just felt like we've been down there. And it was much more interesting to do stuff that had to do with that. That's just almost taken for granted and thrown away. And it's more about like dealing with the type of world where, you know, you can go anywhere with your head. Yeah. This is this is the hottest technology you've written about, so it should be something they should fire up onto the big screen, in my opinion. As we go out, give us your final yeah. thoughts. Give people a final pitch out to pick up the book, wherever fine books are sold, and all that good stuff. Yeah, it is on my. It's on the best way is to go to my website site jamescoxbooks.com. I mean, it is for sale on Amazon, pre-order on Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, everything. It is completely available. All you got to do is type in Grand Theft AI. You can also come to my website if you want to know more about me, which is jamescoxbooks.com. As for the final pitch, like I was saying, you know, you know, they bought the second book. And so hopefully this is a series. Uh, and as I was finishing the proof and the copy edit to book one, like at the same time, I was finishing the manuscript to book wow. two, uh, the week my daughter was born. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. You know, and so on the book, not your daughter. No, I'm just kidding. That was bad. I, I didn't do. Mean to say you that. know, I had a feeling. I was like, I was like, I'm gonna have to go. But I honestly, that is the headline. There you go. And I, I buried the lead. Well, and, congratulations um, on the daughter. Thank you. You know, I was holding her in my hands this morning, Chris, and I was thinking about this podcast, and I was thinking about the long road and all the writing, but especially the bad decisions. The bad and decisions. I was. I was thinking about, and I. You got to save say, this because we're talking about your daughter here. So you got to make a curve here. No, you know, I honestly, like I was. The, that was the thing is that all the stupid, stupid shit I did ah, somehow led to something, someone so wonderful and precious. You mm-hmm. know, and that's what her name means: precious, yeah. a pearl. There you go. And you know the characters I write and. The movies I work on, you know, how I behave, how I interact with people, how we treat one another, it carries so much more responsibility mm-hmm. because I am shaping a life now, yeah. you know, and the world can be dark, but the heroes, they got to be heroic. You know, I'm a, I'm a role model now. Yeah. And, and so I just got to say it, you know, today I am grateful Mm-hmm. For one last chance, or one more chance to share my dreams. There you go. There the, you go. The blessing, the luck mm-hmm. that anyone out there might read something I write, that you might read this book. Mm-hmm. You know, that is a 
blessing from the universe. There you go. It's not as profound as my daughter's smile, but it's a blessing nonetheless. And I, I trust that now after all this, I can show my readers, my colleagues, and myself the humility, gratitude, and respect that this opportunity deserves. And mm -hmm. I can't help but marvel or wonder how had my last book, my, had my last picture not tanked, yeah. my first novel wouldn't be coming out in July. I wouldn't be holding my little baby girl in my arms. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be... You wouldn't be on the Chris Voss show. I wouldn't be on the Chris Voss show. I wouldn't be working with my mentor, Shane Salerno, <laughs> this force of nature, the most talented dude I've ever met. But I got to say what I was saying before, like I would not be holding my little baby girl in my arms, marveling at the miracle that is this morning mm -hmm. and every morning I keep hearing in my head, you know, Captain Miller's last words to Private Ryan echoing over and over again. There you go earn this yeah yeah so thank well, you for having me on your thank show. you for coming we really appreciate it. sharing your cathartic moment your story i mean this is what we love we always say stories are the owner's manual to life and so i love hearing people's stories and their journeys and how they go through them and you know everyone goes through their their learning curves and their moments and and the beautiful thing is like you said the hero's journey you know coming out the other side and and that makes all the difference you know i i remember one time i was losing a lot of money on i think it was our mortgages and i i was sitting down watching the movie with with bogey the treasure of the sierra madre Mm, so and I good. was feeling like I'd fucked up, like I'd lost my business or we lost a lot of money. And I was thinking, like, is it over? And at the end of the the treasure of Sierra Madre, they've lost everything. The gold is blown away in the wind. And they realize, and Bogey's, I probably shouldn't blow all the whole movie, but they basically have nothing after all the work they did and surviving. And the old man says to the young man, he goes, you're a young man. You have plenty of times to build multiple fortunes between here and now. You'll be fine. You're going to be fine. And, and, you know, all these cathartic moments we go through in life, you know, sometimes we just wake up one day and go, God, thank God for some of that bad shit because I turned out great. <laughs> I mean, I can't, you know, there is so much of that in this dude, mm -hmm. you know. I, there was, there is no way that I could have written that mm. and, and had, you know, to really just have the confidence and the, just to go for it because, you know, my first half of my career was all historical fact-based true crime stuff. And then mm. to take that passion for history and build a future history, you know, it had to go down into the abyss. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what makes screenwriting great and rock and roll great, you know? People have to go through the darkness and the depression. I think that's, I joked about Metallica earlier, when they reached a point where I heard James Hetfield say, we can do anything, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, oh shit, now they're going to make that album Lulu and St. Anger. And they did. They had to go back through the shit after that and then figure out, oh, there we are. So James, it was wonderful to have you on. Thank you very much for coming by. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interweb as we go out jamescoxbooks.com there you go and continue success my friend sounds like you're on an amazing hero's journey be sure to come back for the second book too please oh it would be an honor thank you so much there for having go. me on your show chris and it's been a pleasure there you go thanks to my audience for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss all those crazy places we're on the internet go be good to each other stay safe and we'll see you guys next time and that should